here. It's a beautiful day, if uh, you can tell. Beautiful clouds. Uh, hasn't been, well, it's been nice and cloudy these days. We've had beautiful clouds. Um, it's not a rare thing here, actually. Um, even though it's summer and it's uh, starting to get blazing hot, you still get to see a lot of beautiful clouds because we have the foothill here. And there's the lakes uh, behind the foothills. And so, uh, you know, uh, they're nice, but uh, <laughs> it's not nice weather to be walking around and it's, it gets extremely hot. Though uh, I do see some cows happily grazing over there, if you can see them, you know, it's those little black spots in the hills. But anyways, I haven't made a video in uh, a bit. I mean, it hasn't been that long, I, I suppose. Maybe, what, three weeks? Uh, so it, it's not been too long. Uh, hello, single viewer. <laughs> uh, so anyways, just a little bit. I started working again. That's why I haven't been making videos. Uh, or doing much of anything, really. Uh, it's been about... This is the third week. So, you know, it's only been about two weeks. Uh, it's been uh, a really shitty two weeks, honestly. Uh, on the aspect of work... Uh, I mean, it's menial labor at a packing house, it's basically a factory in the field. It's nothing amazing, nothing mentally difficult. But I took a position uh, as a data entryist, uh, you know, which has me running around doing a bit, quite a bit of memorizing, number crunching in my head, and uh, stuff that I'm usually not used to. You know, it took me a couple of days, uh, the first week, to uh, get into the uh, number crunching mindset. I had to do an actual bit of homework. <laughs> You know, practicing at home, doing mental math, uh, figuring out tricks of how you know to do it quickly and uh, whatnot. And you know, that's uh, that's not too bad. Uh, but I did get stuck for the first two weeks here with uh, a person who uh, is the worst person I have ever had the displeasure of really uh, encountering and meeting. Uh, hey, Dan. Uh, and anyways, uh, I felt awful this last two weeks, and finally, uh, two days ago, I finally, you know, uh, had enough of it. And after two of the other leads uh, on the floor uh, actually saw how badly I was being treated by the woman I was assisting, uh, you know, they told me, you know, you got to talk to the managers and uh, either have her uh, disciplined or you know, has to be moved. And uh, she's been there a long time, so I don't think in a, if I got her disciplined, uh, the discipline would then fall on me indirectly because she'd be pissed. So I just asked him to move me and I told him what was going on. And uh, luckily, uh, it, the move happened uh, the, the next day. So you know, yesterday was my first day with us. They changed my shift, but you know, I'm with somebody who is not insufferable, who isn't a terrible person. And uh, you know, hopefully everything will be uh, just fine. And I, it felt great yesterday not to feel like shit going into work, not to feel like shit during work, and not feeling like shit after work. So, you know, definitely uh, the people you work with is uh, a big factor in uh, being able to uh, feel decent at your job. So, I mean, that's part of uh, my what's been going on in my personal life. Uh, other things, I don't know if you can see, like, beautiful clouds today. Uh, hey, Dan. Miss talking to you too, man. Uh, aesthetics. Aesthetics has been in my mind uh, a little bit. I mean, uh, I actually, I literally come home from work now and I just uh, hit the hay. You know, put on something to fall to asleep to and that's about it. Uh, and then I wake up and I, I have like four hours in between but I, I really don't feel like writing anything most of the time because uh, I got to do stuff. So, you know, unfortunately, uh, not much is being done in that regard. And uh, there's uh, the doggo. Uh, he hasn't been out either ever since I started working. It's, uh, I feel bad for him. Uh, but anyways, so, uh, yeah, me and Dan and, uh, and Hyperion, I think Josh was on that day too, where we were talking about aesthetics and uh, going on about... Uh, the interesting aspects of it about uh, how I think basically Hegel has a really good model that makes quite a lot of sense to me and uh, 
to the, my group in general about beauty and how beauty can be objective, how, um, you know, judgments of tastes can be objectively made, and how you can say that people have good taste, bad taste, better taste, worse taste, uh, or no taste, no taste. And so it's a weird, it's a weird thing, you know, the immediate uh, response nowadays is, uh, you know, that just feels wrong. It feels wrong to tell people that the way they feel about things is, you know, that their likes are, are objectively bad. Uh, but when you think about it, I mean, it makes sense. Uh, you know, actually, I had a conversation with a, a girl at work yesterday. You know, the one the one person so far I've found that I could uh, talk to to some significant uh, degree of talking to at my job. Uh, though I won't be talking to her much more because uh, we I'm a di I'm in a different uh, shift now, so I won't be able to see her at break or around. Uh, but I, we were having this discussion about, it and she's like, "Oh, well, you know, she doesn't think that you can uh, make hierarchical judgments about, you know, lesser or greater beauty." And I said, "No, no, I think you can." And I brought up the example about, uh, you know, Hegel brings that too, uh, that you know, a lake might be beautiful, but if you think that's as beautiful as uh, you know, a Roman temple or, you know, uh, got a, a Christian cathedral. Uh, those things are beautiful. And if you think, like, you know, a lake is more beautiful than that, you really don't. You really have some some manner of personal developmental lack. And that's what uh, I was discussing with Dan the other day about how I think that part of the reason we don't want to make judgments of taste is because they're really... Uh, not not very hidden you know it's not very it's not a very big secret that the judgment of taste is a judgment about you as a person your personality not just your personality but your personal development your capacities as a person um and that sounds in bad taste itself but i would stand by it and i will stand by it uh, and actually uh the girl i was conversing with yesterday was an amazingly good example because she wanted to say that you know, you can't make these hierarchical judgments of taste. But every time I brought up anything about the human, the immediate reaction of her was negative. You know, everything, humans ruin everything, basically. You know, nature, nature is superior and your nature is like ontologically higher because nature doesn't need us and humans ruin everything. You know, human existence is like, she didn't say it, but everything was implying around it. Her, her attitude to everything was human existence was, you know, a cancer on the world. Uh, you know, it's, it's this, what's that word? Uh, God, and... You know, where you hate humanity. Uh, God, got it. You guys know the word. I can't remember. It's on the tip of my tongue. Misanthropic. Yes, there you go. So, you know, it's mis very misanthropic. And, you know, I said, and, uh, uh, and you could tell. And so, anyway, if you're misanthropic, there's something wrong with you. You know, there really is. And, I mean, it's not, I'm not saying it's a, a person's fault, uh, necessarily. But there is something wrong with a person who can only see the negatives of humankind. Uh, you know, they, they, it's just like the person who only sees negatives in politics, who only sees negatives in, in you know, economics, who only sees negatives here and there. And, you know, if one thing is negative, everything's negative. You know, there's no positive value to anything. Uh, and so, you know, I tried to explain to her, you know, why I think that you, we can make, and we must make these judgments of taste uh, about higher, higher forms of, of beauty. Uh, and in which human forms of beauty are just, or really are more beautiful. Uh, you know, a lake is beautiful, a sunset is beautiful, these, I mean, these hills are beautiful. And, you know, and the kind of beauty that you feel for these things, however, is not the kind of beauty that you feel when you, you know, you enjoy a good movie, when you enjoy a good song. Uh, and it's not simply, and part of it is I try to explain to her, like, look, it, it's it's not about that humans are above anything, it's rather that humans embody a higher principle of real freedom. You know, that humans really are above it, no matter how much you want to pretend that they're not. You know, like, we dominate the world, not just practically, but consciously. You know, in the very fact that we can, that our consciousness can intake the rest of the world, you know, the, the consciousness is a universal existence. It's, it's, uh, that's something I just came up with, by the way. Consciousness is a universal existence. I mean, uh, I think that's somewhere in Hegel, but, uh, kind of just dawned on me right now that you know the very fact of consciousness consciousness is a universal being in which everything else enters consciousness and consciousness itself is its own object through its finding itself in this unity of the rest of the things that fall into it so yeah i mean it's a it's an interesting thing i don't know what uh, 
you all think about that, about uh, how taste is that partly because nature is somewhat subject to its own change, its own caprice. In other words, a landscape can't consciously make decisions about itself. Yeah, you know, a landscape can't can't embody much freedom. You know, grass can't just uh, it it isn't free. You know, it's it's stuck where it grows where it grows. It's stuck where it is. You know, it's conditions condition it more than our conditions condition us. You know, if we, if we get too hot, we don't have to sit there and bear it and die. Uh, we have ducks to walk on, we can move, you know, um, and if the whole world is hot, uh, we have this thing called, you know, consciousness and intelligence and we get to, uh, you know, construct things and change our environment as needed. Uh, and so, you know, we, we really are just ontologically higher, you know, anybody who denies that is just uh, fooling themselves. Uh, and, and for the matters of, of beauty, um, I think that's also largely incontrovertible in the fact that anybody who argues that, you know, a scene like this is greater in beauty than, you know, a Shakespearean play, uh, there's something wrong with them. You know, they really don't understand. They, do, they really don't have the capacity to recognize how beautiful and what is beautiful in a Shakespeare play if they believe that. You know, I because I think these hills are beautiful, but... Uh, you know, hills have never made me cry. Hills have never, hills have never made me uh, feel, you know, the greatness uh, that I feel with uh, certain literature, certain music, and certain other forms of art. Um, and uh, those things of art, which you know, art is always something crafted by, uh, you know, spiritual beings, uh, evoke things which no natural scene ever will. You know, uh, certain things you could say, oh, well, you know, it's a sad landscape or whatnot. Yes, but uh, that's not sad like a sad story is. Or, you know, the, the scene itself is not in itself, you know, something that really calls forth that much of a depth. Except for, you know, certain contingent uh, relations that people have to things. Um, and that's one of the things that I've... Uh, and this stopped my writing at the last time we were talking, Dan, where... Uh, I'm trying to give exam. I was trying to get into the determinations of the subjectively objective taste, as we were talking about, uh, about how. Uh, I mean, right now actually was a good example. I was uh, for some reason uh, Outlaw Star came to mind. Uh, I remember that I liked the ending themes to that anime show, and uh, so I played them. And um, I mean, they brought tears to my eyes. And I mean, it's not just, and it's because. They are beautiful songs, uh, you know, like they, they feel sad, they feel melancholy, that's what they're supposed to be. They have this sort of, you know, sweet melancholy feel to them. Uh, I don't know what the fuck they say because they're in Japanese. But uh, there's also the sense in which I realize that a lot of what I feel for that music uh, is not for the music itself. It is because of nostalgia. It reminds me of childhood. I saw that show when I was, uh, you know, early teens. Uh, and, a, and a huge amount of nostalgia comes from that, you know, there's a huge personal subjective element in that in which that song resonates with me not because of itself, but because of the other associations in my personal life which go along with it. And that is a judgment of taste, but I can differentiate that, you know, a lot of that is simply just circumstances of my life and it's not to do with the object itself. Uh, and I and I think that's one thing that a lot of people can't differentiate, that they don't make that differentiation, that they think that because they like things and because things move them, uh, you know, that these things must be the greatest, you know, it's like certain, it's like people who think that the Beatles are the greatest band ever. Uh, well, just, that's just because, you know, it's the music they grew up with, you know, it's uh, the music they were surrounded to, you know, it's the conditions in which, like, you know, they associate these things with this and that, you know, which are meaningful to them. Uh, and, you know, this does not reduce how meaningful these songs are subjectively um, but it does reduce how meaningful they can be objectively by the way uh, if you watched Outlaw Star uh, when you were a teen don't watch it again uh, leave it to memory <laughs> because boy that, sh that show is trash it's amazing when you're a teen, but, uh, you know, once you watch it and you're like, you have a, a head on your shoulders to think, you're like, wow, God, it's fucking inconsistencies everywhere. Art's not as, art isn't as great as it was either. 
Oh yeah, there's a lot of things that you watch as a kid. You're like, oh, that wasn't that amazing. You go back to it, and you're like, holy shit, kids have bad taste. <laughs> and that's one of the things. I you know. That's, I, I think I'll write that down as well to show to show this because I think it's such a good example. Um, that you people themselves experience this. You know, I think that if you really grow up, people experience this, in which that they go back to things that they liked when they were kids and were meaningful, and you realize they were trash. And you're like, how the fuck did I like that? And you realize that that taste develops you know and then people go oh well taste is subjective well no i mean that the fact that you as a single person can actually encounter have this experience of realizing that something you used to like is really bad taste uh, is not simply a sign of oh well my taste changed no that doesn't i don't think that happens i don't think taste just changes i think your taste develops and uh, you realize that what you used to think was good just was isn't that good you know it doesn't satisfy something you know something that satisfies a child is not going to satisfy an adult and that's just the truth of it why because the adult demands more complexity the, the adult demands more content the adult demands more yeah that connects with the phenomenology of consciousness the evolution of consciousness yes absolutely with the phenomenology of spirit and uh yeah, I'll try to keep that in mind. I'll try to make a note of that because that's a, that's a good example, I think, of what I'm trying to get at. You know, because when we were talking, Dan, we were uh, mainly talking about uh, different people who were into different uh, single genre kind of thing. They they're they're like a a one a one style stereotype. You know, the rocker kid, the punk kid, uh, the goth kid, and all they listen to is that. Uh, and you know, they don't want to listen to anything else. And you know, and uh, what one can go ahead and say, all right, uh, is the stream breaking up for anybody else? Come on. Anyways, what was I getting at? So, uh, you know, it's uh, this, these kinds of people who are stuck with this single aesthetic, uh, and one can go ahead and say that... Um, well, oh yeah, as, as, as I was saying, I was discussing with Dan this, and uh, we'll go ahead and say that, yes, there's beauty to all these other things, but we can definitely discern a different level of beauty. Um, and notice that, I mean, that's important, I think, that we have to talk about levels of beauty rather than just like, oh, well, this is and isn't beautiful. No. Um, you know, when we, we have these kinds of things, there's a way to talk about things in which you don't have to be absolutely negative you know you don't have to just say well is this completely not that because that's hardly well if ever the case you know it's very rare i think that we can't say that certain things are this or not or that or not this or that although there are because once you have a conception of things it automatically bounds so you know so certain things i think would Significant a lot of things would fall in and a lot of things would fall out and for me honestly. It's not that meaningful um, You know, I, I think that there's like a lot of people want things to be called art which aren't art uh, You know people some person, you know gets a glass uh, Some kind of trash item ready to normal item places it in the middle of a gallery. He's like, oh, that's his art um, No <laughs> No, it's not and you know and people I mean this is such a joke that you know people have done this you know they take something like a glove or you know some bottle cap put in the middle and people think it's an exhibit part of the exhibit or something and they walk around and they're like what does it mean you know what does this glove on the floor mean uh you know and people are like ah there you got a reaction now it's art uh no it's not it could be it could be you know i'll admit to it it could be it could be really shitty art i'll admit to that but for the most part um i think it's pretty easy to to notice when those things are and aren't art uh you know, like uh, these hills, we can all agree, aren't art. They're beautiful, but they're not art. And uh, I think that's wonderful that Hegel has his distinction between natural beauty and human beauty, uh, spiritual beauty, in which uh, spiritual beauty is what is properly called art, whereas natural beauty is beautiful, yes, but is not, you know, as high as what art can achieve. And... Uh, Going back to what I was saying about personal development, uh, you know, if you can't look at these hills, if you can't look at these clouds and think they are beautiful, there's something wrong with you. 
I'll say it, you know, there's something wrong with you, deeply wrong with you. You know, if you can't appreciate the beauty, the natural beauty of this world, there's something wrong with you. If you can't appreciate the beauty of the sky, the stars, there's something wrong with you. You know, it's just like how, and I would say the same thing, that if you can't appreciate purposive without a purpose, uh, yes, that's the Kantian thing, you know, art is purposive without a purpose. And Hegel phrases it better, I think, in that he says, it's about, you know, Kant keeps understanding purpose as external teleology, whereas Hegel understands true purpose as internal imminent teleology. The beautiful object is a hard phenomenon. Is it a higher phenomenon than something else? How can a phenomenon be of something more than something else? Is it higher as a sensible object? It's not higher as sensible. It's higher in its embodiment of the ultimate reality uh, about self-determination, okay? So, you know, these hills are beautiful, but they're not beautiful for themselves. Uh, they are beautiful contingently, you know, the physics was just right. Just right, you know, the organic, organic life was just right, internal development of concept, you know, it is merely uh, ephemeral. Whereas, it, sorry about that stream cut out right now. Uh, we, uh, everything's fine, let me know. Hello, hello, anybody there? Okay, I'm back. All right. So, um, so I was going back to um, so it's higher. Hegel says it is that art is the idea in sensuous form, and the idea is the thing. You know what Kant calls the thing in itself. That's the idea for Hegel. Uh, the idea is the thing that's both the noumenon manifested in its own self-given phenomenon, self-determined. An, art, an object of art is more self-determined than an object of nature in that, you know, um, the, very, the very notion of inspiration, for example, uh, is very curious. You know, we call it inspiration. You know, we get a, a breath from outside, goes within us, you know, and we, we some, somehow are possessed by the art. Uh, you know, because the art develops itself, uh, and I think that's true. That's true in my own experience of, you know, my own creativity for the rare moments in which I like to write poetry or, you know, make up songs in my head or whatnot. Um, they just happen, you know, and it just feels right the way it develops, you know, and you keep playing around with it until it feels right, and it's not something you consciously really will to do. Uh, you, you know, and the art has this self-determining character of a sensuous nature. And when you have a piece of art, it embodies its concept, you know, and uh, I had this conversation with Dan as well, because like, it, it's very difficult to talk about this because people have this notion of concepts that is merely intelligible, uh, you know, mental abstractions, but they're not. For example, if you have the concept of childhood and you want to make a beautiful story about childhood, you know, a story that perfectly embodies childhood, uh, you're not going to make a story about an abstract thing called childhood. You can't do that. You know, that's not how art works, and it's not how the concept works either. Uh, you have to make a concrete story about childhood, about, you know, the essential character of childhood. And everything in the piece is to reflect childhood. Uh, and you cannot tell a story simply like one tells the story of a diary uh, of, you know, just mere facts, you know, a perfect diary of like every little detail in the world, uh, because otherwise you don't have a story at all. You know, you have to abstract it to the essential character of the concept. You, you, just as the concept abstracts itself, so does the piece of art. And the piece of art, you know, abstracts itself into its own imminent concept. You know, the story of a childhood, but what kind of childhood is it? You know, there's no such thing as a universal childhood. There is, actually, but, uh, you know, it's very, uh, it's very broad, and it's, uh, it's hard to capture that in one single piece, though pieces, you know, various pieces will capture it uh, rather well. Uh, and so, you know, uh, I like I like anime, uh, and this is a pretty famous one. You know, My Neighbor Totoro, you know, a lot of people look at that film and say, oh, that's a film about childhood. Uh, and you look at it, and you're like, what is it about childhood? What's about the, you know, the 
imagination of children. It is, you know, about the enchantment of the world when you're a child uh, and all these other things. And, you, you know, everything in the movie is meant, made and meant to be, to show that. Uh, and you see it and, you know, and you see it and you don't mistake it. You can't mistake it. Uh, you know, and it's not like, oh, oh hello, you know, it's, it's not like a, an in-your-face kind of thing. You know, it, it flows nicely together. So, you know, it's not jarring. It's not just this abstract thing. But you see the concept and, you know, and the whole story is unified around that. And when it's, it closes, you feel an amount of satisfaction because it's complete. You know, there's nothing lacking. You know, you don't go like, gosh, you know, like, can't wait for the sequel. What sequel? There, there doesn't need to be a sequel. You know, it's, it's full and complete, it's, as it sh should be. Uh, and so, you know, the concept particularizes itself, details itself, and then it comes back and closes it as one universal that grasps the entire detail of the movie, of the film, of the story. And uh, this is higher precisely because of that. Because, one, it can embody the reality of humans, which a bunch of painted trees, landscapes, and clouds cannot. Uh, you know, the hills may be painted and may be, you know, distorted here and there in shapes and forms to try to embody something of the human condition. But it's not a very good one. Uh, it's like abstract modern art, you know, and I'm talking, when I'm talking about modern art, I'm talking about you know, that kind of shit of just like paint splattered on a canvas or, you know, these very hypergeometrical lines and, you know, these cubes and the abstract forms. Um, there are, yes, I can concede that, but they're not very good art in my opinion. They're, they're you know, to me, they're some of the lowest art ever. Uh, because in order for you to grasp the meaning that was intended, you have to be given a fucking, like, 20-page essay explaining this. And if you have to give a 20-page essay explaining to somebody what the meaning of your art is, you know, why it is something that we should appreciate, then you have failed. You have absolutely failed. And to me, that's bad art. You know, I don't care if it's famous. I don't care if the stupid, uh, what, what are they called? Is it a Pollock? I don't know. You know, uh, those, I mean, they're nice. You know, they, they're aesthetically pleasing, but they're not very meaningful. To me, they're very bad art. You know, you, do, you don't have to explain very much about the Mona Lisa, for example. You know, it's... Uh, there's a lot of depth to that in the meaning of the symbolism of things, yes. Uh, but even then, even if you don't know about that, uh, one, it looks nice, you know, I suppose. Uh, I don't, I'm not a fan of it that much, but uh, it's also just like, it's, it's part of the human experience. You see somebody, you see a face, you recognize it, you see some sort of intent there, you see some sort of emotion. And, uh, you know, you can contemplate that and you can contemplate a lot of things through that. Uh, but you can't do that very much with, uh, you know, these abstract, really abstract things. To me, that's just another complete failure. But even those, you know, even those poor pieces of art, Hegel would say, are much higher in beauty, uh, literally, uh, than, uh, you know, these foothills and clouds and trees. Um, No, good art is not realist. Uh, actually, Hegel's conception of art makes it so that realism is the worst kind of art. It is a failure of art. Because true realism is incapable uh, Sorry, reading the comments. Where was I? Let me try to finish the points in order that I was going with. Uh, what was I talking about before somebody asked about realism, Dan? Uh, art. Oh, yes, yes. Um, Hegel says that, uh, you know, even something that's really poor art is infinitely superior. And, and by the way, you know, the, the, the qualification of infinitely superior is not that grand. Uh, you know, people are like, oh, that's infinitely better. Uh, yes, you know, there are things that are infinitely better in this world. Uh, no doubt about it. And uh, there is an absolutely intelligible reason why we can say this kind of thing. Because infinitely better things are literally qualitatively higher things. That's it. You know, uh, in that art, e evil in beauty is something technical. You don't have to feel that way because I don't feel that way either. But I can accept that it's true in the fact that if you at least recognize that something is art, you recognize that there is a higher ontological being behind that art, that there was an intelligent hand there, you know, born of a society 
you know, with some sort of intent in its mind, something which these hills do not have, you know, something which represents to me, or rather presents to me, uh, you know, a reality that is imminently higher and explicitly higher than just mere nature. Ism in certain things, uh, you know, whether you like it or not, uh, too bad, that's how it is. <laughs> uh, going on, um, so good art is only realist, then by Kaya. No, no, good art is not only realist. As a matter of fact, realism is, is a failure. Uh, Hegel actually goes on in the introduction to the lectures on aesthetics uh, concerning the fact that uh, mimesis, or I don't know how you would say how you actually say it in Greek, you know, it's, uh, but I say mimesis, you know, uh, miming nature, miming reality, is a really shoddy, shitty form of art uh, because one, it's a failure on its own terms. It cannot reproduce the real. You know, uh, you can you can make the greatest wax statue of this doggo, you know, down to the finest hair. You know, like looks is real. You know, you see these kind of things, and you these uh, you see this kind of shit posted around every once in a while of these hyper realistic artists who make these you know, statues of wax that look you know look real look very real I mean disturbingly real so you know it's, it's the uncanny valley uh, but it's a failure because all it can do is externally look like that but it, it can't reproduce the object it wants to reproduce which is you know real true realism is the attempt to reproduce reality you know one to one and you can't do that you know it's a failure you can't produce you can't produce for example the look of life in a real living beings eyes uh, Nobody really knows how to do that. A painting, however, you, know, you can actually do that with painting, but you can't do that with a fucking mannequin. Nobody can. Uh, it's very, it's an interesting thing. I, it's kind of, it's kind of interesting that nobody's been able to do that, uh, as far as I'm aware. You know, you can't fake it. Uh, you can't even get that look. And not only that, you know, realism. Uh, uh, Synecdoche, New York, is a good movie, I think, about the failure of realism, in which uh, the main character keeps trying to make this play that he wants to make. You know, show us. You know. The, grittiness the uh the total weight of real life you know concrete life and therefore he attempts to literally recreate the entire city he lives in in a play you know down to the very fact that he's having a play so he has a play within a play within a play and he can't and he, and he spends his whole life trying to do that and it's a failure because he can't do it because it can't be done not only that it's an utter failure because if you do that you lose focus. You have no focus anymore. You know, you, you, you've you lost the subject. You don't know what the subject is anymore. You know, you can say, well, the subject was life. Well, what life? You know, what was the meaning of it? You know, what is the meaning of just showing an entire, like, full detail existence of a city life? Uh, nothing. You know, there's nothing that you can focus on and say, oh, this was the real meaning. You know, this was the essential meaning of everything. Nothing. You know, it's... Random things happen in life, you know, thing, unjust things happen in life, meaningless things happen in life. Uh, and if you just include everything that really happens empirically, which is what realism is about, empirical reality, you're a failure. You're an absolute failure because you have no point anymore. You know, there's, the point of art is that it's, it, it, it must be abstract. You know, it must have a point. Uh, it, even when it's just, you know, random shit. Uh, even that randomness itself is an abstraction. Yeah. And so art is necessarily abstract. Art is necessarily surreal. You know, surrealism as such, I think, you know, is one specifically extreme brand of, of this. But I think art as such necessarily must be surreal, uh, in which it must present to you something that seems plausibly real, yet you know that's not how reality empirically works. But it's, in, it's how it intelligibly works. Uh, and so anything that's really artsy, uh, you go and see it, and it has just scenarios, you know. I mean, look, Shakespeare. Shakespeare has soliloquies. When the fuck does that happen in real life? <laughs> you know, the way that... Uh, could suppose the aesthetics, paths of the Greeks had a lot to do with geometry, smoothness, formal perfection. Yes, it did. Um, Hegel goes on about that. Um... And I mean, uh, bear in mind that Hegel thinks that the Greeks had the most perfect form of art uh, in that it was the highest uh, 
the highest form art could really take in that the Greeks deified the human. You know, the Greek gods had human bodies. You know, their divinity was something that humans could see within themselves. You know, you look at the statues of Zeus and, you know, big muscles and all these other things. You know, great physique. All the, and the women as well. And uh, you could see it, you know, like uh, the gods did not look other than us. And so Hegel thinks that was the highest level art could achieve on the purely sensuous side. That the, the peak of sensuous appearance one-to-one -one was there. But, cross of Jesus, scars and blood. Uh, misery, but still something that is seen as the most perfect. Uh, so yeah, so the Greeks had uh, what Hegel thinks is... Uh, come on. He's finally tired, but I hadn't brought him out to walk uh, in about two weeks, so I felt bad for him. To, it's hot, but, you know, I think he'd prefer to uh, do a little bit of walking. So yeah, so there's the Greeks. Um, isn't that realism? Uh, well, not no, not quite, Dan, because, um, I mean, the Greek body, the Greek statues of the human body were based on... on a, in a way, in that it's it's based on in an unreal. I mean, we talk about this nowadays. You know, unreal beauty standards. And, and Hegel talks about this as well. And he says, "Look, you know, you're going to age. You have you get like things like birthmarks. You have scars. You have all these skin conditions. You might have you know some like uh, genetic condition that you know bent bones, whatever. You know, and no matter." beautiful you are no matter how hard you are you know man or woman you're gonna get old and you're gonna get ugly and so human beauty is extremely limited and you know artistic beauty is always going to put human beauty real beauty or rather empirical beauty is, is what I should say empirical beauty to shame uh, and because beauty is too high of a standard for nature anything natural and we are natural beings you know to live up to you know everything every Everything, everything ends eroding and you know fading away uh, and so you know like the Greeks didn't make I mean it's it's a sort of weird thing nowadays right uh, that nowadays we have this idea that you know we should just accept the empirical and like why are you, you know, why are you body shaming I mean what is it Plato in, in Socrates in one of Plato's play uh, dialogues says something along the lines that it's an absolute shame that a man you know grow old without having you know uh, lifted weights and you know known uh, the limits of his physical beauty you know the limits of his physical strength and beauty and uh, you know in a way I think that's that's right <laughs> he only said so because he was ugly uh, is there a relation between the aesthetical and the ethical uh, I think there is uh, but not not arising from the aesthetic. I think that the ethical, uh, if there's anything ethical about aesthetics, it must be from aesthetic, from ethical concepts, which rise or, or which determine the aesthetic. The aesthetic itself is immoral, really, uh, and we see this. We see this immensely because artists tend to be this, these kind of people who are generally not very ethical people. I mean, let's face it, you know, a lot of the great artists that we admire, just like the great people in the world, uh, most of the time, are terrible people. Uh, and they do things not with really any moral care. Uh, for example, uh, me and Hyperion recently uh, an extended cut, uh, fan cut, ex putting in like about an, almost an hour's worth of uh, cut footage on Dune, Dune uh, by David Lynch. And if you and I was listening through the making of documentary of that movie, and uh, some of what Lynch says, Lynch is a very spiritual person, which I did not know. Uh, you know, you listen to a lot of his interviews, and he's very into spirituality. He's he's very into trying to make uh, art for its own sake. You know, art for art's sake, and art for the development of mankind. Uh, and he doesn't care about the morality. But he says you have a vision, no matter how hard it is, no matter how you know, um, how much it may uh, incite disgust and you know offense to somebody, you know, by what you make. 
uh, you have to stick true to your vision no matter what and you have to try your best to keep it that way you know that it's, it's the tyranny of the artist uh, for example and I mean like Lynch literally is extreme don't walk on glass Lynch is extreme and like there was a scene in do some smoke bombs and he's like no that way, that's not black enough and the only way they could get that black oak was to burn these toxic <laughs> tires from I don't know tractors or something or big tires apparently and he had like this group of like 2,000 people in like these fucking suits rubber suits you know getting heat stroke in the fucking middle of the Mexican desert you know trying to film this uh, in a couple days and if you breathe in this toxic black smoke you know while you were supposed to you were, were supposed to be running through this shit you know for this one shot if you breathe it in it actually paralyzed uh, your vocal cords and you could not speak. God knows uh, if you breathe in far too much more than that, uh, what would happen to you? Certainly some kind of cancer. But he didn't care. <laughs> he didn't care. He still wanted to do it. He wanted his black smoke, healthy, dead. And everybody else probably didn't know anything and they just kind of went along with it. Didn't realize how bad it was until they actually did it. Another one was that they had a scene in which like uh, one of the characters had like a... Uh, their face blown off and like the smoke was supposed to like like they had like this uh, poison smoke uh. hello am i back sorry it's stream dropped oh there he is uh let me know if uh, the stream's back up Come on. Uh, but anyways, going back to Lynch. So Lynch Lynch tried for a long time to get the actor to actually drill a hole, drill an actual hole in his cheek so he could get an actual smoke effect of smoke really escaping a hole through his blown out cheek. <laughs> and they had to work, the rest of the team had to work really hard to convince him that this was not just unethical, which he did not care, but illegal. <laughs> and finally he relented and he said, fine, we'll just do a, you know, special effects. Uh, but it shows you, I mean, like, artists tend to be, and also, I mean, like, someone say, like, uh, Dali, Dali was highly immoral. I mean, the guy didn't give a fuck. Uh, mistreated people all the fucking time, was an absolute... Uh, well, I can only see the guy was crazy, <laughs> crazy tyrant. Uh, so yeah, so you know the artist uh, that is uh, necessary, something that is uh, amoral, uh, not immoral, amoral. It doesn't really have a moral stand uh, for whatever it is that you're doing, whether it be something like you know Geiger's, uh, you know, sort of art, you know, which is a lot of skulls, uh, deformed alien kind of things, you know, creepy shit. Uh, it's still something that you. Know, even though it's it's not necessarily good uh, in the sense that it promotes some kind of goodness in the world or does it, or embodies some kind of goodness in the world, uh, it doesn't. And nonetheless, um, there is a goodness to it. Uh, maybe just maybe art could be seen belonging to the same category with evil and grace, which are both unjustifiable. Only just justifiable, my friend. Um, I, don't think so. I think art is justifiable uh, on its own ground. That's kind of Hegel's project to show that it is, that its concepts justify themselves, that beauty is something for itself. It is, it is good, but it is not the highest good. So, you know, Hegel has this sort of trifecta of truth, beauty, and good uh, as identical. But uh, unlike it is for Plato, uh, for whom these things are supposed to be immediately identical, for Hegel they're not. Uh, for for Hegel, these things are ultimately uh, subservient uh, and in a hierarchical order. That's why we have uh, art, religion, and philosophy as the three major things. You know, art is the beautiful, religion is the good, philosophy is the true. And the true uh, holds over the good and the beautiful, and the good holds over the beautiful. And the beautiful is really the lowest of, you know, the three highest forms of spirit. Of spirit.
but you know just because that is said doesn't mean of course that uh, art can't be good you know that art can't be good and true um, and I think Hegel's Hegel's hierarchy also works that way in which you have art that uh, goes to various places here and there and you know and the, the matter and there's a dual, dual aspect to art by the way and of course you know we know it's obvious but uh, somehow it doesn't feel obvious in theory uh, that the cre the art the the meaning of art for the artist and the meaning of art for the consumer or the observer of art consuming is bad is, is kind of a a bad word for that you know the observer of art the contemplator of art uh, is not quite the same there's a there's a sort of a symmetry between the creation of art and the uh, the contemplation of art in which there is a different process of meaning and meaning creation in the creation of art as well as the the observation of it uh, where for example uh, Art as a self-expression, you know, which uh, I think uh, all art, to a significant degree, is. Or it is a self-expression. But uh, the question often comes about well, how much is the expression expression of individual self, and how much is it of a universal self, uh, and how much is it of the self of the concept that is being sought after. You know, because uh, it's like uh, any imagination, really. You know, you, things pop in your head sometimes. You're like, where the fuck did that come from? You know, that's not me. Uh, and sometimes... Uh... <laughs> Nietzsche. <laughs> I don't know what Nietzsche says about art. Uh, I know he likes art. I mean, uh, basically his, his whole thing's about aestheticism. Um, but uh, I don't know. I don't know what he says about it. Uh, I can't imagine I actually probably uh, disagree. Um, I probably mostly agree with him. I find that most of what Nietzsche says I agree, and I just don't agree that it's the absolute standard by which we can comprehend anything. So yeah, that's been on my mind. Uh, I don't know, anybody got any... Anything to add, questions, or whatnot? Otherwise, it's a really nice day. One has to also remember the social dimension of art. The artist has also, also, also always wants to be recognized, wants to be validated in the eyes of the other's artist. Um, I don't think so. Uh, I think that's I think that's sort of a modern. Well, it's not a modern thing, but it's it's mostly the emphasis of modern life. You know, it's capitalist uh, life. But there's plenty of artists who you know are famous now. They weren't famous when they were alive. They still pumped out art like crazy, uh, even though they weren't recognized. You know, William Blake is somebody who was criminally unrecognized. Uh, who else is? Who else is it? There's a Spaniard who drew the paintings on his walls, you know, they're called the black paintings. Uh, the famous one is Saturn eating his sons. Um, Goya, Goya, you know, wasn't doing those for recognition to be recognized by his artists. You know, they were self-expressions. Uh, they were miserable, but they weren't miserable because they weren't recognized, I think. I think they were miserable because they had something to say and people weren't listening. I mean, like, there's a difference there between wanting personal glory and wanting to put out a message. William Blake, for example, wanted to put out a message. Uh, and if anything made him miserable, it was the fact that nobody was listening. You know, he, he put a lot of effort into his art to try to communicate something divine. Uh, and if you say that, oh, William Blake was miserable only because he wasn't famous and nobody recognized his genius, I highly contest that. I highly contest that. Uh, I don't believe one can truly say that's the case. I mean, and sometimes people get famous uh, and they regret the fame, uh, mostly because uh, they really were in it for the art. Someone like Dante, for example, uh, you know, became famous for a, a first set of po poem books. By the time of uh, writing his Divine Comedy, he had repudiated 
almost everything that he had written before in what had made him famous, but he was already famous for that. Indeed, fame is not the same as recognition, but it is a form of recognition. Though I'm, though I'm like, I'm not denying that it's a big factor in the misery of a lot of these poor yet, you know, later great artists. Uh, that uh, who is it? Uh, Van Gogh, for example. Uh, you know, Van Gogh uh, was miserable because he wasn't recognized. You know, he did a lot of paintings, put out a lot of work, uh, but he wasn't recognized. And indeed, uh, I think uh, quite a bit of his misery was indeed that uh, he didn't feel appreciated. Uh, and that's that's certainly something necessary for human beings. That he, he, they must feel appreciated. Uh, you know, I'm not going to pretend that I don't do my philosophy. Be appreciated. Uh, would I still be doing blogs? Would I still be writing? stuff that I do. Um, probably, but not to the same extent. I probably, wouldn't I probably wouldn't publish any of it, but I would keep writing it privately, you know, and uh, it would probably be of a lot lesser quality because I wouldn't get any much of any feedback on anything. Um, you know, this is one of the few things that I do in my life where I feel that something true about me is actually recognized. Uh, no, I'm not in grad school. I didn't go to university. I went to a community college, uh, for about five years, uh, almost got two associate's degree, and then I had a depression spell, and uh, I dropped out. And uh, afterwards, that I, I was tired of being miserable at school, and that I didn't want to spend ten more years to get a PhD. Uh, especially when I read about and heard about all the uh, the stories of people, both who had succeeded and people who haven't succeeded, uh, and the nature of academia, and uh, you know that severely dis disillusioned me and having any hope of bothering with that. Well, sure, there always remains a basic desires. We are social animals. Uh, but I think, uh, I think that's sort of a, a trivial and banal thing to say. I mean, really, it's like, well, you know, it's like people who go and say, well, you know, really, ultimately, everything. You know, like, we do everything for selfish reasons, you know. Somehow we we interject ourselves in there's no such thing as altruism. Well, yes, in a very trivial sense, there isn't. Uh, but why bring it up? I mean, it's it's so trivial that, uh, you know, you, you have to universalize the meaning of things so broad that it becomes meaningless. Uh, so, you know, yes, there are always personal desires involved, yeah, uh, even in, directly and indirectly. Uh, but there is also the case that uh, you know, so long as that's not the prime, the prime reason why people do things, and I think there's plenty of artists who don't do it for that prime reason. Um, you know, it's it's sort of a worthless thing to bring up. Come on. <laughs> look at these hills. Well, all right, I've kind of run out of things to say, uh, and I got to head back home to uh, get ready for work. So uh, nice to uh, do a little stream, have a little bit of a chat with you guys. And uh, all right, this has been uh, AW.